pay for it. Well, much smaller from Korea in 2008 than in 2006 and 2007. Now, what had happened in 2006-2007 wasn't that foreigners stopped investing in Korea. It was that you had liberalization, and Koreans were allowed to invest much more abroad. And so it was more generated by more Koreans buying stocks uh, and bonds in other countries. But it's very hard. There isn't any one place that I know of that you get a nice set of statistics that allows you to break this all down. It's very hard to follow what's, what's going on, the point that Keishin's been making. Uh, they, they need to make a lot of, it, it really can be important to look at gross versus net flows. Uh, was there a huge uh, outflow of portfolio investment in Korea? Well, if you look at the statistic of the dollar value of foreign investment in the Korean stock market. It looks like there was a huge outflow. It went from, well, I won't look up the, the, the exact numbers, but it was it was something like uh, 300 and something before the crisis. Dropped down to 120, 140 billion. Okay. Huge fall. What were the actual outflows? Probably 10 to 20 billion. Most of this was the decline in the value of the stock market and the decline in the value of the one. So that the actual portfolio outflows were much, much smaller than the story you can get by looking at just the dollar value of the investment. Same with uh, tremendous concern the market had with the sh high short-term debt. Bank debt fell only in the order of about 10 billion during the crisis. It wasn't the, the, so the big focus on the stock market uh, outflows and bank uh, debt turned out they weren't trivial, but they weren't really very big. Uh, one of the interesting things, and this will be the last couple of points, just two or three minutes uh, more. Um, Korea, in my view, had way more reserves than Korea. But not, not everyone reaches that conclusion. There are various ones, like if you had, take 30% of Imports, or three months of imports, plus uh, short-term debt, plus 20% of the stock market. You'll get a conclusion that uh, Korea didn't have enough reserves. Uh, but you don't get the plus. You could even have domestic aid flows from uh, domestic M2. If you look at it that, you can get the idea that to be completely safe, you need horrendous amounts of reserves. Now, what we've done, uh, take a different approach, is look at, in various crises, how big are the egg flow. And you have to be like, we've got some tables of this from an earlier study uh, in there uh, from the earlier Asian crisis. And that was based, we just gave the summary ones here, but we're calculated capital outflows a bunch of different ways, including errors and emissions. And we take the higher values of those, and none of the outflows, for example, in the Asian crisis were ever as much as short-term debt of the total outflows. And these were very, very big prices. So the one conclusion is uh, the outflows in these crises in practice tend to be very substantial, but a lot less than you might expect if you were just thinking theoretically what might uh, flow out. And I think that's very important for our concepts of, uh, of reserve adequacy. So in my interpretation, in the Asian crisis, the market sort of understandably but wrongly 
got too worried about vulnerability of uh, Korean international financial elements to the crisis. As a result, uh, I think they became too pessimistic. And to me, that was a case where you should intervene to slow down the amount of depreciation. Uh, the government, the central bank, did substantially, but I think they probably should have done uh, even more. As I say, that's a very unusual uh, argument uh, for that. Uh, the last thing is, how should we deal with all of these somewhat volatile capital flows? Uh, or, uh, just short answer, we can talk about this in more uh, detail. As you get more capital, financial capital flowing in, I think you need to hold more reserves against it. So you should sterilize part of the reserve inflows coming in. I think a lot more work should be going on, and I and some of my former students are, are working on this among others, of sort of what proportion should you want. Now, that does mean that capital inflows are imposing a social cost on the economy. Because to keep the same level of risk, you need to hold more reserves. And reserves are going to be earning less, you know, less than the sort of normal uh, interest as the quasi-fiscal cost of it. So in principle, there's a case for putting a small tax or some type of regulatory requirement, uh, like a pollution tax, to offset the sort of increased social cost. You know, there could be lots of technical problems uh, with doing that, so I don't want to come in strongly and say I'm positive that one should do it. But things like the tax Brazil uh, recently put on uh, is something that I think we shouldn't just reject out of hand and say, oh, that's capital controls, that's bad. I think we need to be paying serious uh, attention to it. And we have to have the announcement that Jim circulated here that uh, not exactly the same thing, but with the Korean government thinking more about how you do market-friendly policies to sort of limit the size of capital, uh, capital influence. Thank you. I think I've spoken overly long. No, I think you went about two minutes over. Ah. That's why. Thanks very much. Uh, and we'll have about 40 minutes of discussion as a small group. There are uh, microphones on the table, so you shouldn't get need to uh, uh, speak too loudly. And uh, we can open it up. But I don't know if we want to organize this and start on sort of what the figures that is Korea's exchange rate policies, reserve adequacy, and the issue of capital control. So, Joe, you want to start us off? I, I had a question on exactly that right. issue. So, um, I'm coming to this from someone who is not focused on Korea. So. Don't assume that, that I have some hidden, you know, uh, zinger I'm trying to unleash on you. I really genuinely, genuinely want to know, but at the same time, I, I, I do have a, a bit of a point of view, and it's about what you last spoke about on the reserve and capital flows. You only briefly, early, a bit earlier, touched on this issue of um, what I thought was very important is the mismatch idea. You know, short-term borrowing, I presume in dollars, you can say, or some form yeah. But it was to finance foreign investments. Mm -hmm. but, uh, so it seems to me. I mean, if uh, it seems to me that, that the way I would have thought about this is, is mismatches. Are they borrowing in one currency to finance assets in another currency, and are they borrowing short term to finance assets that are long term? Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that that sort of would should be the focus of regulation. And then if you did have a, if you did encourage the government, the government absolutely, and encourage the private sector as much as possible to prevent those things. It seems to me you wouldn't really need reserves at all in that world. Uh, but I guess the question is, uh, to what extent are they doing that? To what extent does Korea really need to borrow in foreign currencies? I mean, surely there must be some foreign investor demand now for one asset as part of diversification. Korea has a nice record of, of macro stability relatively speaking. It seems like it would be an attractive uh, currency to play some role. Uh, so do they need to borrow foreign currencies? Are they, do they have significant mismatches? Uh, are they focused on this issue at all? And what do you think the role is, should be going forward? Does anyone else have a question on just this particular area? Yeah. Uh, 